Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Welcome on stage, the chairperson of the Accounting Authority of the Services CETA, Mr. Stephen de Vries. Welcome to our annual general meeting. My name is Stephen de Vries. Uh, I'm the chairperson of the Services CETA. Um, before I introduce my fellow accounting authority members, may I humbly request that we take time to observe a moment of silence in the remembrance of the over 41,791 South Africans who have lost their lives due to the COVID-19. More especially, may I request everyone in this room to stand up and observe a moment of silence in honor of the services seat that departed accounting authority member, uh, Mr. Victor Msomi, an employer representative. Please stand. Thank you very much. Um, delegates, please allow me to officially declare the 2019-2020 Annual General Meeting officially open. I will now introduce the Accounting Authority members of the Services CETA. From organized employer, we have Ms. Jackie Ford, Ms. Julia Nzamande, Mr. Kevin Cowley, Ms. Nkolo Gogo, and Ms. Nukubongo Mkoi. From organized labor, we have Ms. Patricia Sitole, Mr. Weisman Dinwa, Mr. Asif Chabtam, Mr. Cedric uh, Mutlong, Mr. Temba Mutsweni, and Ms. Rendani Lamini. From the community organizations, we have Ms. Ellis Karanja, and Mr. Andrew Badela. 
This AGM is a statutory meeting of the board following the minister's tabling of the annual report in parliament on the 22nd of October 2020. In terms of the service sector constitution, our business of this meeting is the tabling of the annual financial statement, the annual report, uh, the report of the Auditor General, and the 2021 and 2022 budget and business plans. Our term started during a difficult time of COVID-19. Therefore, our immediate task was to gain deeper understanding of the organization as a new board. At the same time, we are to focus on implementing COVID-19 regulations for the PZ sector as gazetted and directed by the minister. The reports and plans that we present today were comp com completed during this challenging period. The former accounting authority adopted a strategy called the road less travel. This strategy implies reaching all corners of South Africa and learners often marginalized in terms of access and infrastructure. The road less traveled means several rural communities and learners and enabling learners with disability. This was no easy task and presented continuous challenges, but the potential impact is far reaching. During the year under review, the services sector made massive strides in developing and deploying systems intended to improve its business operations. Among these systems is an e-learning platform and invoice management system. Thieving problems are typical when introducing new systems, but stakeholders can look forward to improvements in the future. The accounting authority notes that the organization's overall performance declined from 97% in the prior year to 73%. The 25 to 24% decrease was due to the shortfall in targets for learners, uh, learner enrollment under program three of the annual performance plan. The regression was due to uh, prioritizing exist, uh, the existing of learners from active projects enrolled under NSDS three. The entity continued to verify and manage its high level of financial commitment in the year under review and implemented tighter expense management. Regrettably, the Auditor General has issued the services sector with a qualified opinion for the 2019-2020 financial year. And audit findings that impacted this audit outcome include misstatements identified in prior and current year balances under understatement of irregular expenditure and inconsistencies between discretionary grant regulation and internal policy. Management and the accounting authority have already commenced work on the remedial plan to resolve and present the repeated findings. The CEO and the CFO will also reflect on this. Given the current environment and operational context, as the new board, we have to adapt to change and work with all stakeholders to sustain and grow our sector with limited resources. Our new circumstances require us to rethink priorities and to be seen to doing the right thing at the right time. Therefore, we must rise to meet today's challenges today. In the past few months, we have concerned ourselves with developing a deeper understanding of the organization, its processes, and the environment in which we operate. We acknowledge that service standards during the lockdown period may not be at the desired levels in some business areas. As the accounting authority, we are determined to find workable and lasting solutions in consultation with you, our stakeholders. COVID-19 negatively impacts on the services sector and the sector. We have seen a decline in revenue streams due to restricted economic activities. Our country has experienced a sharp drop in the GDP growth and combined with business lockdown has led to many companies closing down, which has resulted in retrenchments. This together with remote working also resulted in limited working place or limited workplace training opportunities for learners in the services sector. 
Looking ahead and informed by the National Skills Development Plan 2030 and research demand, the services, the services, uh, the services CETA sector skills plan 2021-2022 identifies the following priorities. Promote social and circular economy through entrepreneurship and cooperative development initiatives. Two, increase throughput the rate of occupationally directed qualifications through the mobilization of key industry role players. This we won't be able to do without the active participation of employers. Thirdly, improve the pipeline of supply by ensuring the relevance of qualifications and capacitation of training providers, including our TVET colleges. Fourth, expand access to the skills development to employees uh, and learners residing in rural and peri-urban areas of South Africa. The, su the success of this will be partnerships with you in the industry and also those uh, of public entities. Without the partnerships, we won't be able to succeed. The development of seven new qualifications was one of the highlights for 2019-2020. The service CETA knowledge and thank the community of expert practitioners for their time and expertise that have volunteered to help the service CETA develop and realign these qualifications. We thank you for the dedication for skills development and we will carry a small token of appreciation to you from the accounting authority. The accounting authority is considering alternatives for reducing the high levels of financial commitments to enable the initiation of new opportunities that will respond to changing sector needs during and post COVID-19. Also supporting business recovery and business turnaround. The accounting authority will focus on organizational performance and closely monitor the implementation of remedial action plans. The accounting authorities have, has identified the need for inclusive and transparent engagement to better address stakeholder needs and expectations. We view this engagement as urgent and critical. Thank you. I will now invite the CEO, Mr. Menzi Fakude, to present the 2019-2020 annual report, and he will also give some highlights for the new financial year. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, if I may uh, take the opportunity and thank uh, the Services City Accounting Authority uh, for the opportunity to present the annual report of the Services City. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge uh, uh, the chairperson uh, for uh, acknowledging the, uh, the pandemic and the, the pain that we as a country are going through. Uh, we have planned to place a video uh, that will remind uh, us of where we are as a country. Uh, but I will also uh, just allow uh, the technical team to put the video through before I start. Thank you. Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives or the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Since the end of 2019 and from the beginning of 2020, the world has learned this lesson firsthand thanks to the novel coronavirus, better known as COVID-19. The virus has wreaked havoc across the world 
It has spared neither the strong nor the intelligent. All nations, great and obscure, prosperous and poor, those regarded as the best examples of democracy, and those typifying dictatorships, have all had to adapt to the reality of life in the time of COVID-19. While Darwin understood that adapting would be a slow and gradual process, COVID-19 demands that we adapt and sometimes readapt immediately. We simply do not have the luxury time to ponder for too long what the moment demands of us. Such is the pace of the change in how we live, work and do business, that we have to reorganize and sometimes do so mid-flight. COVID-19 demands a wholesale change. Whereas the acronym BC has had one meaning in the timeline of history, these days it can easily be said to imply before COVID. All business decisions must be made with the dual aim of preserving and enhancing lives and livelihoods of those who work for, do business with, or have regulatory expectations from the services CETA. What was once thought to be technology of the future is here today. Change is the only constant. Sometimes this change is with immediate effect. What might hold today may not have been the same standing by the end of the same day. Unhappily, just as it has happened in society, we too at the Services Center have had our fair share of loss. We have seen colleagues succumb to the deadly virus. As we mourn them, we remember to be grateful that many more have survived and are back at work. That said, it is business unusual. That we are gathered in this manner is itself indicative of how times have changed. The rapid changes, of course, bring with them the new hitherto unseen opportunities. Our role as leaders in this organization is to harness opportunities provided by these changes. We can either approach the future with fear and trepidation or embrace the present with all its challenges and opportunities, with excitement and courage. I am sure I speak for all here when I say the latter option of acting with courage and conviction even in the most difficult moment, is a lot more in keeping with who we are at Services CETA. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a clip uh, from uh, our accounting authority member, uh, Ms. Mkoy. Uh, I think the most important thing to take away from the video is that we're in a process of change and change is going to be with us for quite a long time as long as we're still around. Uh, it's important for me uh, when we prepare the organization for the future that we, we give you some feedback of what has happened for the financial year 2019-2020. Uh, I will take you through the environment under which uh, Services CETA operated, and I will take you through how we performed over that period of time, and I will spend some time uh, highlighting where we are and what we need to take forward in building to the future. The environment under which uh, Services CETA operated uh, for the financial year 2019-2020 it was characterized by depressed uh, economy uh, where as a country from 2018 we have been experiencing some limited growth and have always been a threat uh, on our ability to access uh, funding as a country. Uh, we also uh, experienced uh, the last 12 months of NSDS-3 uh, which is our skills development strategy uh, where we needed uh, to finalize most of the programs uh, that were uh, 
aligned solely with the NSDS-3. Uh, we also embraced uh, some changes uh, uh, from our accounting uh, author uh, executive authority, uh, DHET, where they were also trying to think forward and prepare uh, the, the, the environment uh, uh, for, for, for the new use of uh, information that we generate uh, from training uh, learners. Uh, we also uh, continued uh, with our focus on transformation and increasing access into skills development. And also, we continued uh, to contribute into our secondary objectives of uh, transformation, uh, being rural development, uh, being uh, supporting other initiatives uh, in, other, in other sectors. Uh, uh, I, I will just take you through some of the highlights in terms of our performance, and I will take uh, you through some of the challenges that are either inherent uh, to the fact that we are services CETA, or either are inherent because of the year that we had, 2019-2020. Uh, uh, we are very proud that we were able to complete uh, uh, funding the learners uh, that uh, completed their studies uh, in 2020. 2019-2020, we had 2,152 that are now uh, fully fully qualified uh, through our bursary programs. The majority of those uh, were, were were unemployed uh, uh, related learners, and uh, 834 of those uh, were employed uh, learners. And 2019-2020 uh, uh, financial year uh, saw us uh, also improve in terms of our deliverables for the candidacy programs that are linked with our services sector. And we also very proud of that. Uh, the chairperson uh, uh, says uh, a lot about acknowledging uh, the, the CEPs for their contribution towards develop, develop, developing seven historical qualifications, uh, which includes a labor inspectorate, uh, a, a beauty therapy, a plumber, laundry worker, stone mason, small business, and office supervisor. Uh, we are very, very grateful because some of the research or the work that was done uh, has never been done in the country, especially for the Imbalma related qualification. Uh, the challenge that we will continue to have uh, as a sector as a is that our sector is the most diverse uh, sector. Uh, we are the biggest uh, sector of CETA in terms of the membership, uh, whereas uh, in terms of uh, the contributors uh, to, to the levies of, of the CETA, we've got very limited uh, players. Uh, it is uh, very evident in terms of our interventions because uh, the benefits or our mandate includes all the, the, sector, the sector stakeholders not only those that uh, contribute levies to the sector. Uh, I, I think it's also inherent that because of the high number and a lot of uh, SMMEs and co-ops that uh, are, are part of our stakeholders, we, we do experience a very low per percentage of participation in our programs and also in terms of our mandatory grants. Uh, we have been having uh, circumstances uh, where towards the end of the implementation of NSDS-3, including the current financial year under review, 2019-2020, uh, we started to experience significant bottlenecks uh, in implementing uh, 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 discretionary grant projects. Uh, as we move forward, uh, trying to prepare uh, for the unknown, we invested a lot of funds uh, in, in building system that uh, support uh, core business of the CETA. Uh, unfortunately, our learning experiences when we try to move uh, uh, the, 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 the traditional processes into uh, the, the systems, uh, we experienced a lot of problems uh, for the year 2019-2020. Uh, 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 I would just uh, give a, a high level uh, summary on the performance uh, significantly, we uh, regressed again. We, 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 we did not achieve a positive uh, outcome in terms of the audit. 
Uh, the Auditor General has a lot to say on that. Uh, we also uh, have an overall performance of 73%. In a nutshell, uh, what informs that kind of performance uh, was our low performance uh, on learning interventions. The fundamental reason for that is that we were on the last year of NSDS-3. As a business, we took a conscious decision uh, to focus on, on completing projects that we already had. Uh, that did not only came with the lower uh, efforts in terms of new, uh, new projects, but it also created a significant outcry from our stakeholders in terms of new windows not being opened, uh, even those opened not being finalized. So we ended, we ended up uh, sacrificing performance, and at the same time also the sector became uncertain of what was going on. Uh, when we move forward, uh, you will realize that uh, the financial situation that backs up those kind of intervention is also had a lot to do with that performance. Uh, on administration, uh, we still uh, performed very well. Uh, however, the other contributor is that on the year before that, 2018-2019, uh, uh, we also get a qualified uh, audit opinion. So it took that performance down. Uh, this is a high-level uh, view on the audit outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm sure our colleagues from the Auditor General will have a lot to say about that. But the, the fundamental issue is on commitments. Uh, so we started implementing NSDS-3 as a CETA later uh, than the other CETAs, uh, because uh, when NSDS-3 st started in 2011, uh, services CETA found itself under administration. So under the administration process, not a lot of activity was taken. And so we've got a lot of projects that are sitting on top of each other. And as uh, the systems and processes uh, get uh, overloaded, uh, the administration process, uh, and the, it created some chaos where we were trying to, to, to speed up implementation and close performance gaps but we created an administrative and operational bottlenecks. Uh, we also had a challenge on irregular expenditure. Uh, I always feel it's important that I, I spend some time on irregular expenditure because uh, although it's, it's a responsibility of the Auditor General to, 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 to help me uh, clear the understanding, uh, irregular expenditure uh, is realized when uh, the, 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 the public entity or the CETA in our case does not follow one, the applicable legislation or two, its own policies uh, when they, they operate. Uh, the biggest uh, issue that we had as a CETA in, in the year 2017-2018, we planned uh, to spend uh, on discretionary grants, meaning that it was an expenditure for the programs that we already had sitting on commitments, but we under budgeted by 932 million. So meaning that we ended up spending more than what we had on the budget. So if you look at our, 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 our audit report, you, you will pick up that there is an irregular expenditure for 932 million that came from the year 2017-2018 but it's mainly uh, because uh, of the budgeting. We, we under budgeted. Uh, if I draw the relationship between that and my previous point on the commitments, uh, it's because even though uh, we budgeted a less amount which was restricted by our revenue, however, we had a lot of commitments which were more than uh, the revenue that we had and we also had a lot of reserves so we could afford funding it. Uh, we also have an issue with performance information. In my earlier slide, I highlighted that uh, they had uh, uh, changed the way that we're supposed to report. So there were tedious issues uh, that we experienced when we were reporting to DHEAD towards uh, the, 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 the end of the last financial year, uh, which is 2019-2020. However, given the fact that the audit uh, took place uh, where we already under uh, under attack from COVID-19. So some of those processes that were meant to clear some of the issues were not cleared on time, and we ended up 
having to conclude the audit process without really clearing those processes. Uh, we also had a couple of uh, accounting uh, disclosure issues. I'm not going to dwell that on much. Uh, uh, Dr. General and the CFO will, 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 will say a lot in that. And we also have another challenge on the project support cost. Uh, as a CETA, we receive our levies uh, in, in line with the Skills Development Levies Act, and we are allowed to utilize some of that money to fund discretionary grants. However, there are constraints within that as to how much we can use to support uh, the implementation of those projects. So the limit has always been 7.5%. So in cases where we were spending a lot, uh, it was easier to stay within the 7.5%. But with that declining reserves and lower uh, activity on discretionary grants, uh, the challenge will be bigger on that given our current uh, structure. Uh, I'd like to spend more time uh, just to align uh, uh, the, the delegates uh, uh, with our current financial position. Uh, as, as you could see, I tried to start uh, from 2017, 2018 financial year. Uh, at some point, I wanted to go all the way from to 2021 and 2022 to highlight our budget, but I just thought that uh, I will leave uh, for the budget presentation so that we can see how the future looks like. As I explained earlier, uh, we had a situation in 2011 where we were taken under administration. That process indirectly uh, allowed the CETA to accumulate a lot of reserves. Uh, if you go in most uh, uh, sectors of our community, Services CETA is known not only by being big on size because of its membership, but is also known to have a lot of reserves. And those reserves uh, accumulated in the period of administration and they only started getting utilized when the, the, the new board, which is uh, the third board from, if I count from this one, the current one, on. So you can clearly see that uh, in 2017, 2018, we had reserves of 869. Uh, but for the year in question, uh, 2019, 2020, we are already sitting at 218 million. If you look at our cash reserves, uh, in 2017, 2018, we still had 1.4 billion sitting in our bank. Uh, but by the end of... Uh, uh, 2019, 2020, we had only 421 million. It's very, very important to see how we were, we were, we were draining those reserves because during those times, our performance uh, was sitting uh, at a very high level, 81% in 2018, 97% uh, in 2018, 2019, and uh, for this uh, year under under question 73%. So, so it, it's evident that uh, we were spending high to reach those high level of perf uh, performance. Uh, the first year, 2017-2018, we spent 2.5 billion, which is evident. We spent the money that came in plus some of the reserves during that year. Uh, if you look at uh, in 2019-2020, on discretionary grant uh, expenditure, we spend only 1.7 billion, so it's already lower than the 2.5. Uh, but however, uh, the money that has been coming in uh, from 2017 to 2018, uh, it has been 1.7 billion. So we didn't increase our revenue. Our expenditure uh, was at higher than what we were receiving, uh, meaning that we were funding that through our reserves. So our reserves have been wiped out over that period of time. Uh, the interesting thing is that our level of commitments uh, remain high. Uh, we were sitting at 4 billion 2017, 2018. Uh, for the end of this uh, uh, financial year under question 2019, 2020, we were sitting at 4.6 billion. Uh, if you compare 4.6 billion with our reserves, especially the cash reserves, uh, it's uncomparable. Uh, we are way overexposed when it comes to that. Uh, the 
issues about financial uh, commitments uh, that it does not come alone. Uh, we've got commitments that we've already made that are part of 4.6 billion, but also uh, we had opened windows uh, in the last three, three years uh, where we ended up not awarding. Uh, one reason being uh, we were looking at our overcommitment status to say we already have 4.6 billion and our reserves uh, have declined. So if we add more burden to it, and one, the National Skills Development Strategy number three is coming to an end, meaning that some of the programs that we already have might not be relevant. Uh, already we, we have a, a challenge with, with our finances. So we delayed that. I will talk to, to that uh, later. And we also had projects that had not started, uh, which is also a big question to say, in the 4.6 billion, we've got projects that have not started. And then we have projects uh, that are experiencing activities. So learners are being trained in that particular, particular area. So as a sitter, we really had to sit back and look at what we need to do. Uh, but before we do that, we thought it would be appropriate to engage our stakeholders and, and get to understand uh, what is frustrating them and how they would uh, advise us to handle the situations going forward. Uh, we, we, we think it's very opportunistic for us that we come to this uh, uh, AGM having engaged with our stakeholders because we can bring uh, some of the inputs uh, into this meeting. Uh, there is a challenge uh, that the CETA is currently experiencing on, on its uh, support systems, mainly the learner management information system. Uh, that outcry has always been internally and externally so. The situation that we have in the country where we need to work remotely did not help uh, because some of the communication uh, with our own uh, uh, staff, uh, it's now extended from office to office, uh, but to also try to connect from home. And it has created a lot of un instability. Uh, I'm happy that there has been an, 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 an increased focus in trying to deal with the, program, with the problem. Uh, but it's one area that was very, very prominent uh, in all the stakeholder engagement. So, uh, the services sit board is aware with it, and we every every day uh, doing everything that we could to try and bring back the reliability of the system. The other issue that we had to deal with uh, it's the awarding of the advertised discretionary grant projects. Uh, those that I highlighted in the earlier slide to say we opened the windows in two three years ago, and we have not uh, awarded those those projects. Uh, on the 25th of November, uh, the Accounting Authority made decisions and, and, and concluded that process. Uh, we, we are happy that we started communicating those awards, especially for the projects that we would like our stakeholders to start implementing with as soon as possible uh, in the last quarter of our 2020-2021 financial year. Uh, I will take this opportunity and, and, and align what I said earlier. Uh, services CETA is now uh, implementing uh, the new strategy, NSDP 2030. And services CETA, as I've mentioned in the earlier slide, it, it has some constraints uh, because we are looking at 4.6 billion already committed. Uh, so it is important that as much as we will conclude an award, but our focus is to identify programs that are relevant in the new mandate and programs that are, are more relevant in the sector at this particular moment. Uh, I do expect a backflash in one way or the other where the numbers uh, that we are awarding are not in expectation or what the stakeholders are used to. Uh, but... Uh, uh, if, if I may say, it's motivated by what, we, what, what impact we think is required in the sector and what also what is guided, uh, is guided by 
the, the NSDP 2030 program. Uh, we also uh, receive a lot of feedback on projects where we have awarded, uh, but we, we stalled implementation of, of the projects. Uh, we have started the communication, especially for the projects that we would like to start uh, in this current quarter, but we will also be communicating to all the, the entities and the stakeholders that were awarded. Uh, the, the, the main message is, is that uh, the projects will be honored and with the view of starting uh, uh, later in the next financial year, but we will communicate the specific information on how to start in the first quarter of the new financial year. So, so the, 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 the next issue about when are we opening the new window, it goes in line with uh, when are we communicating uh, to start uh, 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 implementing projects that were awarded but stalled. Uh, the accounting authority uh, has objectively taken a view uh, to say the sitter should look at opening the window and make a decision every first quarter of the, of the financial year uh, so that they can be in a position to implement uh, those projects that are necessary for the sitter performance still in the current financial year. So, so going forward, uh, there will be communication about uh, the, the, the opening of the window uh, in the first quarter of 2021-2022 financial year. Subsequent to that, uh, the accounting authority in quarter three will also review its performance in line with the, the targets, in line with its finances, and they will also make a decision uh, to open uh, the, I would call a complementing window to see if after opening that window, after getting those response, are we still experiencing some performance gaps that we need to patch? Uh, that's the commitment that uh, the accounting authority uh, was willing to make to say they should make those decisions in those, uh, in, in, in those quarters for whether they open the windows or not. Uh, the, other, the other issue was the issue of funding uh, towards sector employers. Uh, in, in, in our annual report, uh, we do disclose uh, the, the commitments, and, and you could clearly see that we do uh, allocate a significant amount to special projects. Uh, in, other, in other sectors of our stakeholders, it does create a challenge because uh, the ratio started to be leaning towards special projects. And we do acknowledge that although the motivator has came, uh, the reasons are always coming from the good place because to implement NSDS-3 is not in different in implementing NSDP 2030. Uh, you cannot go schools, uh, skills development without collaborations. So sometimes you invest uh, in foundation uh, and then you, you, you start to, to build your house later. So I think what, what has happened with, with, with the services CETA is that we, we, we've dwelt with the, in a lot of projects that are enablers of facilitation of skills development. But we, we, we are very cautious of what has happened in the past and the implication of that in the relationship with stakeholders. And we will take into account uh, funding towards sector employers going forward. Uh, if I look into the future, uh, it, there are a couple of areas that I would like to highlight. Uh, obviously, when you look at where you, you are, uh, it's important that you take what you need to go forward. Uh, needless to say, all the things that are, 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 are keeping you stuck in the past, you try to live and, 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 and build uh, from where you are and move forward. Uh, my colleague will, will take us through to the planning uh, 
for the 2021-2022 financial year. Uh, but I, I wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge the building blocks of what went into that plan. We did took into account the impact of uh, COVID-19. Uh, in a nutshell, COVID-19 for the CETA, it does not necessarily uh, affect our funding ability, but even our delivery, delivery models are, aff are affected uh, by uh, social distancing, uh, by our inability to interact. Uh, so we did build that in uh, when we were doing the plan uh, to deal with uh, uh, the, the mandate of implementing 20, uh, NSDP 2030 going forward. We also took into account uh, that uh, there is a, a direction that uh, skills development uh, 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 industry is taking. We are moving towards new uh, occupationally directed qualifications. So that process uh, of, of training on, on traditional or legacy qualifications has got a timeline. So there will be a lot of programs uh, that will come into play for the sector uh, to be prepared to train on the new qualifications that will be coming uh, uh, via the QCTO and other other new processes. We also took into account uh, the NSDP 2030 priorities that were mentioned uh, by our chairperson earlier, uh, which basically say we need to work with industries and try and fast track the implementation of scarce and, scarce and critical skills. Uh, we need to uh, uh, fast track our, our collaboration with TVETs and skills development practitioners in delivering uh, uh, skills development. Uh, we need to capacitate uh, 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 and, 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 and provide skills development for those that are, are, are in rural and other disadvantaged areas. So we did take into account, so it, uh, our budget and planning process is informed by that. And we also took into account that uh, maybe from the previous strategies, NSDS 1 and 2, uh, the sitters were trying to do what employers can't do. Uh, they were trying to train for the, 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 the sector when employers were trying to train for themselves. That was the perception then. I think the learnings during NSDS 3 uh, were very clear to say, but you cannot train for employers without employers. So the current reality uh, of NSDP 2030 it's collaboration. We need to work uh, with employers. We need to work with our partners, other CITAs, other partners from other government departments uh, for us to successfully implement uh, NSDP 2030. Uh, we also took into account the fact that uh, the sector should inform our planning in, in indirectly or directly. Uh, we have chambers uh, at Services CETA, which represent in the main all our employer groups. Uh, we, we, we need to make sure that we embrace the work that they do uh, as, as, as employer groups uh, so that uh, when we do plans, when we open window, we take into account what the sector really needs, what the sector plans are. Uh, we did uh, 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 factor that in in the 2021 and 2022 uh, APP. We also thought that our business processes needs optimizing. Uh, we had done a lot of decision in terms of managing stipends, but we still feel that there are still issues that are compromising on the CETA mandate. Uh, we did a lot of changes on the Basari admin administration processes but we still feel that there's a lot of challenges, uh, there's a lot of room for improving those processes. I have mentioned earlier that our uh, uh, MIS or, or systems in general, uh, they have been work in progress. We still uh, uh, need to integrate those that are stable and we need to stabilize those that are not stable. So we believe that going forward, especially with better communication, uh, we will be able to support uh, the core business to deliver on their mandate via 
communication better uh, with with our stakeholders. Uh, the other areas of 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 of, 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 of optimizing processes will will shape uh, the future of every entity. I won't, I won't like to say of the CETA because we work with our stakeholders. The environment that we create, uh, it should uh, try to assist uh, for 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 the CETA and its stakeholders uh, to remain in business uh, during, during the the environment that. Uh, that, that will be very new for all of us. Uh, most organizations have started uh, using the e-learning uh, platforms, and we've also developed our own, and we, 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 we are partnering uh, with, with other, other providers to, 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 to make sure that the platforms that we, we, we developed are working optimally. We also uh, believe that uh, when uh, training is taking place, we cannot longer afford to go and do monitoring the way we used to do them. Uh, so remote monitoring is going to be the, f the feature for the future, and we are busy uh, uh, preparing ourselves to continuously uh, uh, do and, and learn from, from uh, uh, monitoring remotely. Uh, the processes that are critical to the CETA, like accreditation and certification, including external moderation, uh, it's very, very important that we, we, we also automize and, and can be done without contact. Uh, we know that there's a lot of backlogs in terms of those processes. A lot of our uh, skills development practitioners uh, suffer uh, uh, heavily on that. Uh, we are looking at ways that uh, in the future, uh, we don't have an expectation that we need to mail documents or uh, have visits for verification in those areas. Uh, finally, I, I, I would like to go back to, to the words of the chairperson, is that the National Skills Development uh, Plan uh, 2030 it, it's primarily based on collaboration. Uh, as a sector, uh, we have an opportunity or a chance to succeed if we work together and the future remain in our own hands. I thank you. Thank you. For the next presentation, please welcome on stage Mr. Tewola Matsebe. Good afternoon, um, stakeholders, board members, and colleagues. I'll be taking you through the audited financial statements for the financial year 2019-2020. My presentation will cover five items, statement of financial performance, statement of financial position, statutory disclosure, audit outcome and uh, plan of action to address the audit findings. For the financial year 2019-2020, in relation to revenue from exchange transactions, which mainly uh, is made of um, investment income, we recorded a decrease of 60 per percent, which is attributable to their uh, <coughs> reduction in, 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 in reserves from 2017-2018. Um, revenue from non-exchange transactions, which is mainly made of levies, we recorded a, a slight increase of 2%. The overall revenue uh, did not increase as the, the, the investment income. Um, significantly decreased. Uh, on mandatory grants, we recorded an increase of um, 
9.8 per percent, which indicates that our the the our our employers are now uh, part participating in uh, the participation is, is is improving, and the claim rate there of as you can um, see it's not aligned to the to, to, to the increase in in revenue slightly higher 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 uh, discretionary grants. On discretionary grants, we recorded a decrease of 38.4 percent, which is um, attributable to the uh, decrease in in performance. Um, <clears throat> it 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 works like um, the 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 um, the uh, product life cycle um, when the 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 product it's 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 performing uh, sales are high in this case the performance was 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 a bit low hence the the performance on discretionary grants is 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 low is lower <coughs> on admin on admin on administrative expenses uh, we also recorded a decrease uh, mainly this was in an effort to achieve the um, um, financial sustainability of of the organization <clears throat> the overall expenses we recorded a decrease of um, 32 percent and on uh, um, sur uh, surplus or deficit we recorded an increase of uh, 110 percent and um, <clears throat> In 2018-2019, um, we had um, recorded a deficit of 715 million, um, which was mainly attributable to the performance in the then year and the high subscription on the in the in the um, the the rural uh, allowances. Hence, the the regular ex 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 expenditure on the um, the under budgeting uh, on the statement of financial position uh, on current assets we recorded a slight increase of three percent this is um, supported by the reduction in uh, in expenditure on non-current assets which is mainly on uh, fixed fee fixed uh, 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 assets um, we the, there is no uh, increase there um, as we did not procure um, uh, much um, assets. This was in an effort to to maintain the 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 um, uh, financial su sustainability and liquidity of the organization. On current liabilities, uh, we have recorded a reduction. Um, the relationship is to the um, expenditure, the reduction in expenditure. The total reserves, we recorded an increase of 26%, which is uh, mainly on the 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 surplus re record while trying to um, maintain um, uh, liquidity on on our on our finances. On the discretionary commitments, um, we have recorded a decrease. The CEO has touched on on, on, on it, on the um, the the plan of action going for, for, forward. On the statutory disclosure, which is mainly on the um, the irregular expenditure and um, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, for the current. Uh, for the year under review 2019-2020, we didn't re did not record any fruitless and wasteful expenditure. And in relation to um, to irregular expenditure, um, the annual reports reflect the closing balance of 130, which um, was um, uh, an element which contributed to the to the um, unfavorable audit outcome. Uh, <clears throat> the AG did not uh, was not satisfied with our basis of disclosing this amount, 
um, the which were based on the on the interpretation of a letter received from the from the from from the minister. So the engagements are ongoing in addressing this 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 issue. The audit outcome it's just on the the comparison to the previous years. 1920, we recorded an uh, uh, sort of qualified uh, or, or, or opinion, and in the previous year as well. The elements that contributed to the qualified audit opinion are mainly on commitments, irregular expenditure. Uh, misstatement in the financial uh, in the in the um, in the uh, financial sta statements uh, and for the 19 also on the on the performance information however they are they will, they it just an emphasis in the in the in the in the audit or, or opinion on commitments um we are still still grappling with uh, my my creating uh, our commitment to 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 automate automation so we managing around 4.5 um, on 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 a manual system from different sources so that um, we experienced delays uh, in the previous year uh, in the mig in the migration um, in the current year we we are the plans are underway, and um, the in terms of the 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 timelines, we are still within the the the, the, the timelines, and we are we are confident that that um, for the current year, will report in the fi fi financial system, which will um, result in maintaining one source of um, um, the report. Um, the Audit uh, in the previous in the in 2019 um, had to take place in a in a in a, a remote. <coughs> the submission of, we experienced a sub a delays in terms of the submission of information uh, between ourselves and the AG due to connectivity cha challenges. That was uh, also a a a a, a, a contributor. And um, our information was both available on manual and uh, um, um, on the on the system. So in the current year, um, most of actually all the 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 supporting documents are on the system as um, we were on lock, on lockdown from 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 April. So that that should should be addressed. On the irregular expenditure, it's on the um, the the me statement on the on the on 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 on, on the balances um, based on the the interpretation of the uh, um, the approval from from the from 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 the minister. So the meeting has been secured to clarify. The content of the of, of the letter and also um, obtain uh, um, con, 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 condo, condonment as mainly relating to the to the discretionary grants and the performance that re related to it. The last one is on the misstatement in the uh, main annual financial statement, which were attributable to uh, inadequate reviews. Uh, due to um, delay to to connectivity cha cha challenges, as we we were um, we had to conclude the annual pre the preparation of the annual financial statements, working um, from 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 home. Um, the we have we have developed and implemented the check the, the checklists for reviewing of the financial statements. Which is um, automated, and also the um, the 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 preparation we had we had, we had already already start, start started, and we'll have a, a a review in February before the the 
final submission of the annual fi financial statements. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now have a video from the report of the Auditor General presented by the Senior Auditor Manager of the AGSA, Ms. Nana Sikwati. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will be taking you through the presentation um, with regards to the audit outcomes for services CETA for the 2019-20 financial year audit. Um, my name is Nana Sikwati. I'm the senior manager um, responsible for the audit of services CETA from the AGSA office. Um, the mission of our office as the Auditor General of South Africa is that we do have a constitutional mandate as the Supreme Audit Institution of South Africa, which exists to strengthen our country's democracy by enabling oversight, accountability, and governance in the public sector through auditing and thereby building public confidence. And it is therefore in such platforms like the AGM this afternoon that we are able to come and present to to you the audit outcomes based on the um, audit of the financial statements and the annual performance report of the entity so that we are able to um, allow the external stakeholders as well as those who are charged with governance of the services CETA to enable them to, to conduct their oversight um, responsibility. And one of the visions that we also carry as an office is to be recognized by all our stakeholders as a relevant Supreme Audit Institution that enhances public sector accountability. And this is in line with the mission that I have just spoken to. If I then continue with my presentation, um, on an annual basis as an office, we do conduct um, the annual audits. And our main focus is to um, express reasonable assurance on the fair presentation, as well as the absence of significant misstatements on the financial statements of the entity. The second area is for us to also um, report on material findings in terms of the reliability and credibility of the performance information for predetermined objectives. And this is mainly on the um, reported achievements that will be disclosed in the annual performance report of the entity itself. The third focus area is to ensure that we report on only in on any instances of um, non-compliance um, that we may identify during the audit with regards to applicable laws and regulations governing the financial matters of the entity. So basically when I go through the presentation, you will see that we will then highlight some of the key findings from all these three spheres, mainly being your financial statements, being the annual performance report, as well as any instances of non-compliance that we would have identified from the audit process. If I then move on to the next slide here, we've got an overview, a five-year overview of the audit outcomes of the CETA. So if I start on my far left-hand side of the slide, you will see that in the previous financial year audit, um, the CETA obtained a qualified audit opinion. In 1819 financial year, they would have received the same opinion, meaning between the current um, audit cycle that we are giving outcomes on in the prior year, there was no movement. Um, in the 2017-18 financial year, the CETA received an unqualified with no findings, which is a clean audit. Um, and in 2016-17 financial year, the entity received an unqualified opinion with findings. And then in 2015-16, the entity also then received a clean audit. So as I go through the, 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 um, the, the slides, I will then be uh, giving you a detailed brief in terms of what then um, contributed towards the qualified opinion for the current year under review that has been finalized, pardon me. Um, if we start with the first aspect that I spoke to, this is with regards to the financial statements. Um, here we, we, we look at the credibility of the financial reporting. So our main uh, per, uh, review or document that we use in order to explain conclude reasonably uh, and to provide assurance on is the financial statements of the entity which they prepare after every financial year end. So we would have received the financial statements, we would have audited those financial statements, and if you look at the columns which indicate the financial years, that is between 2018 and 2019, 2018-19 financial year, 
as well as 2019-20 financial year. We look at three criteria, mainly being the submission of the financial statements by the legislator date. So the CETA did comply in both financial years, and hence the the, the error that is um, pointing towards the right, which shows no movement, as the CETA did comply in both financial years. Um, the second element that we look at is the financial statements. Were the financial statements submitted without material errors? And in both financial years, the response would have been no. If you go back to the previous slide that I was speaking to, you would have seen that the CETA obtained a qualified opinion as well in the previous financial year, hence the response. And um, in the bottom of the slide, I will then look at the qualification areas for the CETA. And then the third element that we look at is the quality of the financial statements after the audit. So this would have been in an instance where um, we did identify material misstatements during the audit. And uh, when management is then afforded an opportunity to either adjust or not adjust the financial statements, we would then assess the quality thereof post the process, um, post the, 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 the identification of the material misstatements by the auditors and correction thereof. Um, in the 2019-20 financial year, um, there were no corrections um, uh, process by management on the initially submitted set of financial Fs, and hence um, th those are the set of financial statements that we're expressing an opinion on, and uh, hence the quality has been assessed as no, as we are qualifying the CETA on, on those set of financial statements. And this is mainly as a result of the misstatements that would have been identified and therefore not corrected um, in the financial statements. So the qualification areas um, that affected the CETA in the 1920 financial year, it's on commitments, irregular expenditure, payables from non-exchange transactions, uh, prior period error, uh, financial instruments, reserves, and related parties. So for the CETA, based on the um, uh, opinion that has been expressed on the set of financial statements, we do note that the quality of financial statements that were submitted for audit remains a, a concern as there were material misstatements as outlined in the qualification areas that were identified during the audit and subsequently therefore not corrected. What one of the key issues or one of the key matters that we um, like to emphasize is that post the audit process, there is um, a process that we do follow to engage with management to develop what we call an audit action plan. And in that action plan, the purpose is to ensure that management is able then to identify the root causes that led to the findings um, that have been reported during a particular audit cycle, and therefore make sure that in the year that it, they are currently in, they are able to then develop um, control activities that will enable them to um, address those internal control deficiencies and therefore prevent any future recurrence of the same um, findings. However, in this instance, in the 1925 financial year, we noted that there were still um, internal control deficiencies that were not adequately addressed or monitored in order to enable um, the non-occurrence of, of repeat findings. So mainly this is also affected in the area of commitments, where in the 18-19 financial year, this was also a qualification area for the CETA. If I then move on to the second component of what covers our audit report, we speak to the uh, material findings on the annual performance report. And this is in relation now to the credible performance reporting of the entity's performance on the set targets. So we look at two aspects, one being the quality of initial submission for auditing. Um, if you look at 1819, the CETA did not have any material findings on the annual performance report, and hence the response there is a yes. However, there was a regression as shown by the movement in the arrow facing down in 1920, as we did identify material misstatements on the um, annual performance report that was submitted for audit. On the quality of final submission after audit, similar process. If there are material findings that we do identify, there would be a process of either management correcting or not correcting the, the annual performance report accordingly. And therefore, uh, we then look at um, the, the revised report in order to conclude on whether or not the misstatements have been addressed. Unfortunately, the quality of the annual performance report that has been finalized on in 1920 is assessed as not being adequate as there were still um, material findings which were identified on seven performance indicators under learning program three, uh, learning program, so which is program three of the annual performance report that were not corrected and therefore then the material findings are therefore included as part of our audit report. 
reliable reporting of achievements. So there are two aspects that we look at when you look at um, the annual performance report. One is the reliability of the reported achievements. So meaning that are we able to get support in order for us to reasonably conclude that the city has achieved on the reported achievements as disclosed in the annual performance report. And unfortunately for the 1920 financial year, due to the material misstatements that were identified, the conclusion was that the, the, the indicators that are affected and, and disclosed as part of um, program three learning programs were not um, reliable in terms of the numbers that are reported. And then the usefulness here, we look at the presentation and compliance in terms of the framework for performance and program um, reporting, making sure that the CETA's annual performance report complies with the framework. And therefore, in that instance, we did not identify any material findings in that respect. Um, one, one of the key things that um, was a takeaway based on the uh, material findings that we had noted is that there was just a lack of adequate systems and processes to enable accurate measurement of the actual achievements for the uh, seven indicators that we refer to in the audit report, as in some instances, these achievements reported in the annual performance report differed from the supporting evidence that we would have been provided with, with hence the conclusion on the credibility of the annual performance report specifically in relation to program three learning programs. If I then move on to the third element of the audit report, we refer to the section on compliance. Um, here is a, an area where we also report on whether there has been any non-compliance that has been identified in terms of applicable um, laws and regulations of the CETA. Two areas that were disclosed in our audit report that were material is uh, on the area of the annual financial statements. One being that the financial statements submitted for audit were not prepared in accordance with the prescribed financial reporting framework and supported by full and proper records as required by section 51A and B of the PFMA. The second element is that there were material misstatements that were identified in the submitted financial statements and these misstatements were not corrected which resulted in the financial statements receiving a qualified opinion. So these would be impacted by this misstatements that I discussed earlier on around the uh, various qualification areas. The second um, criteria would have been on expenditure management, where we are saying that within the CETA, there was no effective and appropriate steps taken um, to prevent irregular expenditure as required by section 51B2 of the PFMA, as it is reported also in the basis of the opinion, which um, irregular expenditure was one of the qualification areas that the full extent of irregular expenditure that has been incurred and reported to the CETA has not been disclosed in note 34 of the financial statements that have been signed off on. So these are the two areas at which um, uh, material non-compliance with applicable legislation was identified for the CETA. Status of internal control. So basically what also forms part of the last uh, section of our audit report is that we give a summary of the key internal control deficiencies that we would have picked up as a result of the conclusion that we are reaching on the financial statements, as well as the conclusion that we are also reaching on the outcomes of the audit of the annual performance report as well. So one of the key things is that we noted that within the public entity itself, there isn't really adequate review of the financial statements and the annual performance report against supporting schedules as material misstatements were identified through the, during the audit process. And these misstatements could have been prevented had effective review controls being implemented. The second element was that also the public entity did not implement proper record management systems to ensure that the reported performance information and financial statements were supported by complete, relevant and accurate schedules and or documents that were readily available. So the last element of it was that there was inadequate review and monitoring of compliance with applicable laws and regulations as instances of non-compliance were identified in relation to the material misstatements and expenditure management that has been reported on. So basically, the key co internal control deficiencies that we have identified obviously do have translate into the qualified opinion that we're now expressing on the set of annual financial statements, as well as the conclusions that we have reached on the annual performance report based on the material findings that we would have identified during the audit process. And therefore, we're saying to management that they need to ensure that they enhance on the preventative controls um, within the entity so that they're able to detect some of these mis um, misstatements earlier on before even 
the audit does commence. So in implementing preventative controls rather than detective controls will also assist management in ensuring that they actually avoid occurrence of these um, internal control deficiencies, which lead to material misstatements, rather than trying to um, react to the fact that a material misstatement has actually occurred and we therefore try to fix the problem. So implementing preventative controls is a, is a, is a rather encouraged um, way of dealing with um, some of these issues that we would have reported as part of the financial statements and annual performance um, audit. Um, in this slide, we're just showing a breakdown of the irregular expenditure. As we all know, irregular expenditure would have been um, payments that have been made by the entity for goods delivered but not prescribed for, uh, or not prescribed in terms of the processes not followed. Um, if you go to the notes in the financial statements of the CETA, you will note that the CETA actually had a decrease in the balance of irregular expenditure um, that amounted to 129 million as at the close of 2019-20 financial year. Um, however, in the previous financial year, the, the closing balance thereof was 269 million. And you remember that irregular expenditure is also an area that forms part of the qualification area. So as the auditors, we are saying, the figure that has been disclosed in the financial uh, statements as it stands does not necessarily um, disclose the full extent of irregular expenditure that was also report, identified and reported on during the audit. Um, as disclosed in the note, um, the irregular expenditure that has been disclosed um, by, by management within the financial statements is in relation to costs incurred in the excess of approved budget uh, was to non-qualifying service providers and construction expenditure incurred in excess of the allowed 20% variation threshold. If I then go to the next slide here, we just reflecting on the fruitless and wasteful expenditure. This would have been expenditure that is incurred in vain and could have been avoided had reasonable steps been taken. Um, in the current financial year that was just finalized, um, the closing balance they offer was zero. In the prior financial year, it was 19,000. And this was due to interest and penalties that were incurred from SARS. Um, and therefore, that is what has been disclosed therefore in the notes of the financial statements of the entity. So in this respect, there isn't really any material findings that were identified with regards to fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Accountability, this is what we call then an accountability wheel. And we are saying that if management then plan, do check and we act on what we need to, to, to monitor within the entity, we should be able then to, to achieve on our set objectives. And if you look at the accountability, we always start with us as management and those charged with governance within the entity who are responsible for the administration and overseeing the operations of the entity. It starts with us then defining the targets of what it, what it is that we want to achieve for the entity, which is part of the planning process. Then we go to the second part of the process, which is the, the action or the doing part of the doing phase of the, uh, of the process, where we say we need to then develop our internal controls and ensure that we are monitoring the, the effectiveness of these controls. And therefore we need to go back to implementing the, the basics that we need to be implementing with it, either our daily, weekly, or monthly or quarterly um, reviews and making sure that everything is being monitored consistently and not only at year end when we need to report. And if you go to the third phase of it, we say we need to then check, somebody needs to monitor and as much as management might be monitoring themselves, those charged with governance as well, need to ensure that they are conducting their oversight and ensuring that as part of the monitoring process, we are ensuring that those that are charged with the responsibility of implementing internal controls within the entity are held accountable and therefore are able to account for the deficiencies that occur within the entity. If you look at the fourth phase, which is the act, we are saying those that are then found negligent of implementing or executing on their responsibilities should be held accountable and therefore consequence management should therefore be implemented. And we say that if you follow this accountability wheel, this will show better results for the entity and make sure that the audit outcomes as well are improved. And at the end of the day, the objective of every government institution exists to ensure that we have a, a positive impact or we better the life of our citizens. And therefore, if we implement the full circle of this accountability wheel, we should be able to achieve the planned targets of the entity and therefore report on good achievements that actually ultimately impact on the better lives of the citizens of the country. 
So lastly, our recommendations to the CETA would be to ensure that management develop adequate controls to ensure completeness of financial and performance reporting and also the credibility of financial and performance data being reported on. And secondly, that management should implement effective proper record keeping processes that will ensure that information is easily retrievable within a reasonable time and available when required for audit purposes and that management and those charged with governance monitor implementation of key controls addressing the root causes and ensuring that there is an improvement in the key risk areas and thereby providing assurance on the quality of the financial statements and actual achievements of targets reported on in the annual and quarterly performance reports. Fourthly, that management should effectively monitor implementation of the audit action plan in order to ensure that issues previously reported on are addressed and corrected timely. And lastly, in order to ensure that the accountability will is therefore completed, is that consequence management should be implemented against employees who have transgressed the law in respect of incurring irregular and fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm at the end of my presentation and I'll then just pause here. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will be. Thank you. To present the recommendations of the Services CETA Annual Budget and Business Plan, welcome the Executive Manager of Planning, Mr. Sibusiso Lala. ladies and gentlemen please may be allowed to to thank the chairperson for giving me the opportunity to to table this presentation to everyone who's in attendance can i then acknowledge the chairperson members of the accounting authority chamber committee members cep members ceo and my colleagues um, thank you for this opportunity my presentation will be in twofold it will be an overview of the skills planning process that we, we embark on as a services CETA, and basically just to give a brief overview of the work that we do that will then um, influence the business plan that we then propose to, to enroll in in the next year. Okay, so in terms of skills planning, we, we follow um, specific guidelines and recommendations that we receive from the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation under the Presidency. Uh, national treasure in terms of the, the frameworks that we need to use and also DHET in terms of the structure of our documents. The first document that we actually present and prepare is our sector skills plan. This is a research-based document because in line with um, the NSDS and the NSDP, our planning must be evidence-based and research-based in terms of the inputs that we receive. The SSP is our key document that helps us identify the priority skills and the pivotal skills that we need to train on. And by this, it means that we then have to embark on a massive stakeholder engagement process to be able to identify the relevant skills that are needed by our industries, including labor market analysis, including economic analysis, also analyze, analyzing our WSPs in terms of what our employers are going to train and those who have submitted WSP so that we are then relevant in terms of our delivery. From the SSP, we then move to the strategic plan. Our strategic plan is a five-year document aligned to the National Skills Development Plan. So this document actually allows us to pull in a strategy over a long period that we can then assess ourselves after five years to note whether we've had the relevant impact within our sectors. It's a document that we update annually to be relevant to the changes that are happening in terms of our sectors as well. So this document will then align our national priority needs, uh, national priority skills needs, the, the direction of the country in terms of your Skills Development Act, your Skills Development Levies Act, National uh, Development Plan, National Skills Development Plan, and any other relevant documents and instructions that would be coming from our executive authority as well. So this document is then um, a long-term plan. We also have outcome indicators in this document which we monitor in, on a long-term basis to see what impact we've had in, 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 our, in our relevant sectors in terms of the skills development trainings that we've, we've been able to initiate. From the strategic plan, we then break it down into five annual performance plans. 
These performance plans then actually detail the targets that we would be enrolling uh, within, the, within each year of the five-year period. So these targets we, we review on an annual basis as well, based on performance, one, also based on our financial resources and human resources and capabilities that we have in place. We have to align ourselves in terms of our financial resources so that we don't put the CETA in a negative space in terms of its financial standing as well. You will, you will notice when I go through the, the actual details of the target, the impact that uh, COVID-19 has also had in terms of the planning and the numbers that we've aligned, also aligned to, to our budget as well, when I go through it later in the, in the presentation. Just to give some highlights uh, in terms of the improvements that we've had in terms of our strategic planning cycle over the last three years, we've actually been able to strengthen the alignment between our threat plan, the annual performance plan, and also the NSDP 2030 targets. So we take the broader targets in the NSDP and the broader outcomes in the NSDP, break them down into the five-year period, how we're going to achieve them, and then further break them down into the annual targets in terms of how we're going to fit in to, to the five-year plan. We've also aligned our objectives to our strategic risks because strategic risks are what also hamper us in terms of achieving our performance. So we make sure that each and every plan that we have is a, has a risk element to it and a mitigation strategy so that we ensure that we've actually covered all bases in terms of our achievement. We've also um, improved in terms of aligning our pivotal training and our priority training needs, uh, meaning that what we've identified in the SSP must filter through all the way down to the APP. So when we enroll training, we know exactly how much we need to train and what we need to train on and which interventions we need to then facilitate that training on so that we further enhance our, our skills development. From these, inter from these engagements and these interactions and these planning cycle, we've actually come up with priority actions uh, in our sector skills plan, which we need to focus on. The first one being to promote a social and secular economy through entrepreneurship and cooperative development initiatives. This priority action is actually linked to our outcome six in the NSDP, which speaks to ent entrepreneurship and cooperative development. So this is one of the priorities. We know that as a country we are moving um, in line with skills development in the traditional sense, also to supporting small businesses, cooperatives, uh, and social partners as well. And then the second one is increasing our throughput rate. This means that we, we need to have directed qualifications, mobilize our stakeholders, have the necessary um, resources in place that will actually assist us in improving our throughput rate, uh, meaning the level of uh, completion that our learners that we enroll in uh, actually finish. This also then helps us achieve in our mandate and it makes us relevant within our sectors because quality training, quality provisioning equals a higher throughput rate. The third one is the improving the pipeline of supply, meaning then moving away from the learners. It means that we look at what kind of qualifications do we have we, re, we need to realign and, and, and redesign our historical qualifications so that we move with the changes of the QCTO in aligning to occupational qualifications. Do we have trains um, and quality skills development providers who are able to deliver on these initiatives? Our TVET colleges, are they fully capacitated so that they can take our learners and put them through the system? So this is in improving on the capacity of supply. The fourth one is expanding access through skills development primarily looking into your, your rural and peri-urban areas. This is a priority of the department and it also filters through all strategic documents, meaning that we need to upskill, especially in the rural areas. It does not mean that we, we then neglect urban areas, but it just means we need to have a fair balance and actually try and push more in your urban areas because resources there are less, so it means we need to put in more effort uh, in terms of skilling there. This is obviously the, 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 the sector skills priority actions which we, we take on an, on an annual and annual to annual basis. From there, to go back to the strategic plan, the five-year plan, it means at the end we need to then look at the level of impact that we had. So as a CETA, this, this is the impact statement that we have in our strategic documents, that by the end of uh, the five-year period in our strategic plan, we need to have a skilled, competitive, entrepreneurial workforce that drives economic growth uh, of the services sector and contributing towards, uh, contributing towards improved quality of life. So this is the overview in terms of the, the level of work that we do, coming from our outputs being from the APP, 
moving towards the impact that we have looking at now our strategic plan and then filtering it back to our SSP to show that we've actually uh, addressed the needs of our stakeholders and the, the needs that have been identified. Then um, from there on, I'm going to move to the actual business plan, which is um, in, in our terms is called the, the annual performance plan. The annual performance plan incorporates the annual targets for the year and also incorporates the budget. So there is an alignment between what we have as a budget and what we projected as budget and what we actually will be training. And this is then um, agreed to with the department in terms of the service level agreement that we, we, we agree to them with on an annual basis to say, yes, these are the numbers that you need to train. So I'll take everyone through. Just briefly, our annual performance plan is split into four key programs, which is a standardized program from the Department of Higher Education. The first program is on administration, which is us as a CETA, meaning that we have to have the necessary internal controls in place to be able to deliver on our, on our mandate. So program one would primarily look at your, your internal control um, assessments, your risk assessments, your organizational compliance, finance, uh, performance management as well, HR-related um, targets as well, and also ICT. So that would be program one, meaning that we have to have the necessary strength and resources to be able to deliver on the other uh, four programs. Program two is on skills development and skills planning. The program two is actually our research-based uh, program, which means research in the sense that there's your research from the onset, where you start your research to be able to feed into your strategic plans, and there's also research at the end, where you then have do your evaluations of the program delivery that you've had so that you can look at the pipeline across to see how well you've done in terms of quality of delivery and what kind of delivery is needed. Then program three is our service level agreement program, which is basically learning interventions and learning programs. The learning interventions that everyone is aware of, including support programs for TVET colleges, community colleges, NGOs, trade unions, and also um, <clears throat> career development services, meaning our career exhibitions, the career development services training that we do as well with the lecturers. Um, this is an ongoing process. This is on program three. This is basically the standardized program which is within the service level agreement of, this, of the DHET. And then program four is quality assurance. Quality assurance meaning that the capacity of supply that we provide has to be aligned to the needs of the nation in terms of standard and in terms of quality. Also, this is where we look at the, the, the throughput rate in terms of our certification, external moderation, accreditation, also the development of qualifications. So that would be on program four. That's just the standardized uh, program. Then um, if, <clears throat> if I can carry on, the next slides speak to the actual targets that we, we are planning for the next year. Then if I can ask that we look into the last two columns being estimated performance, which is our current year target. I have to note that this current year target was revised in July of the year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had to reduce our targets because of, of time, budget constraints, because of the skills levy window, and also the time in implementation, and the nature of our industries meant that under level five and four, we could not implement programs. So we have to then uh, reprioritize and, and ask the department to approve our reprioritized budget and reprioritized APP targets. So the targets that you see here are the, the reduced targets as compared to, to the previous year, to the original targets in the beginning of the year. The MTF period is the target that we are proposing for the next year. What, and then um, audited actual performance, I wanted to show members, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the impact that COVID has had meant that we'd had to reduce targets. You will see it more when we get to the learner numbers. Where we've, we, in the previous years, these are audited figures, meaning they're figures in our annual report. It means that those numbers, the achievement rates were quite high. But because of the impact of COVID, it meant that we had to reduce the this year. And because of the, 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 the long, longing effect and subsequent effect of the pandemic, it means that we cannot then think of replanning and reprioritizing back to the old targets that we're achieving. We need to align ourselves to the current situation as is. But yeah, let me then start with the, the first target is on uh, partnerships with higher education institutions, 
which is your TVETs, your universities, your CETs. Um, we, we've kept the target at 15, which is the 15 for the current year, and then 15 for the next year, being seven universities, I mean seven TVET colleges, four universities and four community colleges. Um, these partnerships are quite broad. They are not necessarily linked to skills development is in training, but they also incorporate elements such as research, um, partnership through other elements that we, we can find ourselves within, um, even work placement as well. And then your, the next four speak to what I mentioned earlier in terms of um, outcome six, I mean outcome five, supporting the growth of the college system, which is in the NSDP, where we need to train uh, TVET lecturers, we need to train TVET managers, and um, we need to have uh, lecturers also being awarded bursaries, and then also support them with infrastructure. Infrastructure, not necessarily being buildings, but also incorporating equipment, uh, ICT, and the likes. So there we, we, we've kept the targets the same. We intend to train, um, sorry, to expose 40 TVET lecturers into our industries through skills program, your short courses. TVET managers, eight of them, being trained on curriculum related studies, which is your curriculum development studies and curriculum, um, um, yeah, cur curriculum development practices within their space and obviously in line with our sectors. And then um, college lecturers being awarded bursaries, we targeting 50 of them. And then in terms of the infrastructure development through equipment and workshops, we're targeting five, as we've targeted five in the current year. And then the next four are looking at now community colleges. Same targets, but just looking at a level down in terms of the, 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 the college structure system. So there also we're looking at um, the co college lecturers also being awarded skills, skills programs. Um, we looked at 10 in the current year and 10 in the next year. And then the infrastructure project in the current year, uh, we reduced to one and we're saying we can actually pick it up next year to three. And then in terms of the, the managers receiving training on curriculum related studies, we keeping the target at 10, uh, as in the current year. And then this is a different one because in community colleges, it, we are now looking at um, adult education and training. So there we're also saying, let's, let's target 10 uh, learners within the AET system. And then um, we're also targeting 10 for the next year. I do have to note that these targets are not standalone targets. They are targets that are incorporated within our learning intervention targets. So when you see the skills program and the buzzer targets on the next slide, these numbers are already incorporated there. So it's not a, a top up to what we've already budgeted for. It's incorporated within. Okay. And then on the next slide, um, the rural development projects, in the previous year, we, we had reported an achievement of seven, but we targeted five for the current year in the reprioritized APP. And we know that because of the, the level of work that is needed, especially for rural projects, in terms of provisioning and access and facilities, we, we are keeping the target of five for the next year as well. So we're maintaining that one. Skills development centers. Uh, we reported 15 in the previous year. We had originally targeted 15 in the current year, but which was reprioritized to, to, to five, and then also maintaining the five in the next year. My apologies for the typo of the one. Uh, it's meant to be five and five for the next year as well. As we know, the infrastructure projects take quite a while to complete, so we've decided to then break them down into multiple years so that we'll be able to realize them without actually then losing focus on our goal to increase access to skills development opportunities. Then um, the next targets, uh, cooperative, uh, sorry, number of cooperatives and SMME supported speaks to then Outcome six, which I spoke about earlier in terms of entrepreneurship and cooperatives, including the target for number of people trained in entrepreneurial skills and the number of organized NPOs and NGOs that are supported and number of people trained to start their businesses. So in terms of the cooperative supported, we're maintaining our target of 600, which is split between uh, the cooperatives and the SMMEs, being 300 for cooperatives, 300 for, for SMMEs. And then the number of people trained in entrepreneurial skills we, we're targeting 100 for the next year, and um, we need to then obviously train members into our, into our entrepreneurial skills through our various departments, being your ECDI department, special projects, and your management and business chambers. 
Then the number of N NGOs that are also supported, we support them through various institutions, um, programs and institutions and program of delivery that actually are looking into ensuring the sustainability of the NGOs. Um, so there we also keeping the target of 100 and 100 for next year. And then the number of people that are to be trained to, to start their own businesses, it's 100 for next year. I think you, you will then note that um, this is one of those um, targets that are specifically aligned to our outcome to say, rather than skills development, you must also then ensure that there's sustainability in the training and there's actually uh, businesses that are started that will actually then show the impact of the training that you've done in terms of entrepreneurship. So those are the, these are new targets, by the way, in terms of our SLA, um, which the department has incorporated in line with us starting in year one this year uh, of the NSDP uh, 2020 um, document. Then on your priority programs, which is now your learning interventions, you'll see the, um, if members can quickly just look at 2019-20, look at the results and look at what we, we've estimated our performance for the current year, you'll see the significant drop because of, of the impact of COVID-19 and the challenges that we've experienced around it. So in terms of moving forward into the next year, instead of going back to the high numbers, to be financially astute and to be risk, risk averse, we've actually then slightly increased our targets in certain areas. We've used an average of about 20% to then move up, but that 20% is accommodated within our budget as you will note later. In terms of your learnerships entered, um, we've moved from the target of 6.4 overall for unemployed and employed to 6.9 for the next year, both unemployed and employed as disaggregated on your screen. Internships entered, uh, especially on placements. We also moved from 1,006 overall to 1,920 for, for, for the next year. Um, disaggregated between unemployed, your TVET placement, and your university placement. And then in terms of bursaries, you, that if, if you look at 2019-20, you see that there's only one number. This is because the SLA was changed to incorporate new learners and continuing learners because then the department tracks the learners who are progressing in terms of the system so that they can see who's eligible to pass and be filtered into the programs such as your honors, masters, and PhD. So now we, we separate the two. Uh, we this year we targeted 1,000 for new and 1,000 for continuing based on an assessment of who was in the system last year. And we've, we've increased the numbers to 1,002 and 1,002 uh, going into the next year. And then the employed buzzeries, which is the worker new, worker continuing. Uh, we've, we've targeted 300 this year and 200 um, for, for, workers this, um, for workers this year. And then we swapped the, the targeting in terms of uh, worker new, worker continuing, because of there's obviously, um, I, I don't want to use the word dropout rate, but there's obviously a, a dropout rate that we apply because of the, the progression rate. And obviously, most people that who are employed find it very difficult to, to prioritize their studies with the requirements of work. So we've reduced your worker new. However, we say it will support those who are within the program already, which is your worker continuing um, with, the, with um, the 360 there as a target. And then on skills programs, this, this, this year we targeted 8,000 overall skills programs, disaggregated between 3,500 unemployed and 4,500 employed. Just to give a brief background on this, when we were hit by COVID-19, we received quite a number of um, requests and a number of communications from various stakeholders to say we need to train on ICT-related programs, for, the, for an example, OHS programs, for, for an example, through skills program, reskill our employees to be able to work. Hence why the number swapped. In the previous APP, which we, we had, we had a higher number for unemployed and a, and a lower number for, for worker uh, skills programs, which then we, re, we swapped them around so that we can be able to, to support our, our industries in terms of the reskilling needs that are needed based on the current situation that we are on now. And we've kept that trajectory going into the next year, wherein we have 5,400 workers and uh, 4,200 unemployed learners to enter into skills programs, which gives us a total of 9,600. In terms of your artisan training, we've slightly increased our artisan training from 500 to 525, aligning it to to our centers of specialization projects that we run with the department and also some projects that we run in terms of skills programs that are aligned to your artisan programs as well uh, in terms of special projects. 
Then RPL learners, we've maintained RPL um, at 200. In as much as we achieved a higher number last year in, in RPL programs, but when you look at the pipeline analysis that we have, there is not um, a significant amount that we actually issued in terms of RPL allocations. So we've maintained that number so that we, we don't then overburden ourselves to be able to enroll an RPL program, which primarily um, would normally fall within your ETDP CTARs and, and those kind of CTARs in terms of RPL training. So we'd have to then uh, work with those CTARs as well in terms of uh, inter -CTA collaborations in terms of that training. So we've maintained RPL at 200. ABIT, we've also slightly increased to, to from 500 to 525. And our candidacies, we've also slightly increased from 150 to 180. Generally, if you look at the trend of increase of increasing, we've increased at around about 20% per target, other than uh, your RPL target. And then, in terms of the that, those are the proposed targets, um, chair members and, and stakeholders. And then I just wanted to highlight the the budget that we we've worked on in terms of our assessment and our very conservative assessment in terms of where we think we will be in terms of next year's financials. Uh, I will not go into much detail because the slides will be available on the presentation and members can go uh, and have a look. But I will touch, touch on the key aspect of the budget that I would like um, um, everyone in attendance to just be aware of. If we look at the, the green there that says total revenue, if you look at uh, revised budget 2021, we had revised our budget down to, ni to 973 million. But now we are saying, if we estimate in terms of, this, this also had to incorporate the skills development um, window that we had to say, no, we, we really need to then tone down in terms of what we expect to receive as income in the current year. But now we, we've, we are anticipating that as the, the situation changes and we assess the situation and the skills development win window has actually um, expired now with, or it's no longer there. We are starting to receive higher rates of revenue, and we anticipate that um, we may, may quite conservatively increase our our revenue by 38% to around a thousand. I mean, 1.3 billion, which we'll then be able to use in terms of our programs. If we then go down to the um, the rate that says total expenditure, you'll see that we we split our budget based on admin, um, your admin income. Um, mandatory grant income, discretionary grant income, which then filter down, down to admin expenditure, mandatory expenditure, and discretionary expenditure to be in line with our grant regulations. Uh, you'll see on the total expenditure, we, we had envis envisaged that we will be spending uh, 1.1 billion this year in terms of the training that we will be rolling out, and then which will result in a loss of, uh, sorry, which will, result, which will result in a loss or a deficit for us for the year of around 151 million. So basically we will be dipping into our reserves uh, and not necessarily using what we are receiving to train what we currently have in terms of our programs that are running. But we're then saying for next year, we anticipate a 14% a increase in our expenditure looking at the plans that we have in place in alignment with our APP. And we, we are then going to look at a a revenue stream of around, I mean, expenditure stream of around 1.2 billion, which will, which will then uh, give us a, a surplus, which will put us in, 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 the, in the green of around 53, 53 million uh, in the next year, if the projections um, become real. And then on your APP budget, so your APP budget would be then aligned to the programs that I mentioned at the top there. The first budget that I presented is the overall CETA budget. And then this budget, we envisaging that for 2021, 20, 22, we will be using a budget of around 1.2 billion for our training programs from program, uh, from program one all the way to program four to facilitate skills development within our APP, which would be a 15% increase from what we are envisaging to, to play in the current year, which is that 1.1 billion that I mentioned in the previous slide. So we, 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 are, we are thinking if things go well in the next year, this is where we might sit, but obviously we do a budget revisit and revisit on our, on our APP every six months to align to what is currently happening and to, to ensure that we are, back, we are in front of, of the curve. If there are any challenges, we're able to address them on time. 
And then just this slide, um, I had already presented these targets in detail in terms of the APP targets, but I just wanted to show um, everyone that if we were to train those learning interventions, this is the cost that it will lead to, which is 691 million, which is still uh, below what we've, we've planned to, to, to um, train on within our discretionary grant uh, budgeting. But this means that it, at least it gives us a buffer to be able to then either um, uh, w whether the storm should there be other projects that maybe need remediation or the extensions that are needed. At least we've, we've created a buffer. Because if you plan for one for one, if something goes wrong, then you're already in the red. But, but as a positive, it means that we will be moving our target of learners from the current year from 19,865 for next year to 22,000. I mean, 22,925, which at least is an increase in terms of our offerings and, and, and what we, we intend to, to train. Chair, I th that is the last of, of my slides and presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the Q&A session. Questions relating to the presentations have been noted and will now be answered by the CEO and the chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairperson. I received a couple of questions. Uh, I must say most of them, they, they were specific and operational in nature. I will do my best to, to try and answer them adequately. Uh, I received about nine questions on discretionary grants, especially uh, on when are we opening the discretionary grant windows, and the second part being when are we uh, making awards uh, on those windows that we have opened, and the third part being uh, when are we going to be advising on the commencements of the awards uh, for the pro uh, on the commencements on the projects that were awarded. Uh, already. Uh, in my presentation, I, I tried to indicate that uh, the Accounting Authority of Services CETA has taken a view that every first quarter it will assess and make a decision as to when to open a window. Uh, I also said it's a continuous process. Uh, that CETA uh, open windows in order to implement uh, its uh, mandate, which is to implement the National Skills Development Plan 2030. Also, on the third quarter, uh, the accounting authority will further review the progress uh, in terms of the implementation of uh, the APP as uh, my previous, uh, the previous speaker has, 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 has indicated. Uh, they will also assess on quarter, in quarter three whether there is a need to open a complementary window to close any performance gap. Uh, on the question as to when uh, the awards are going to be made on windows that were opened in the two, three, uh, last three uh, financial years, uh, we have made the decision on those awards as, and the accounting authority uh, 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 concluded the process on the 25th of November. In January, we set ourselves a deadline to communicate those, those outcomes. So the process is started. Uh, if uh, other stakeholders have not received correspondence, it's coming. Uh, that process, it, it's ongoing in terms of advising on those, on those windows. Uh, in terms of uh, when uh, the stakeholders can start to, to implement uh, projects that were already awarded, 
uh, we we will be communicating uh, with all affected stakeholders, whether they start in quarter four of 2020, 2021 financial year, or they will be starting in the next financial year. Uh, I, I think I've addressed the, the questions that I summarized from, from discretionary grants area. Uh, I had one uh, question uh, in terms of the, the DG contracts expiry, uh, and the, the question was mainly on uh, given the inconvenience uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, there will be contracts that have expired, but the work is not complete. Uh, what is the process of extension? Uh, the Department of LIPC, uh, it's available. Uh, I think in our platform, we, we try to make contacts. Uh, if they are not adequate, we can always go to a Services CETA website. Uh, then you can make that inquiry and the LIPC will advise uh, with the right process that needs to be adopted to facilitate contract extension. Uh, I must say we do expect a lot of these uh, uh, queries uh, given the delays that we experienced uh, in the 2020 uh, uh, year uh, uh, because of, of the delays caused by the pandemic. Uh, the next section, uh, there were also a couple of questions on accreditation, uh, which, uh, in my view, they are also linked uh, on the same basis that there were delays, uh, because normally our accreditation process uh, does incorporate uh, visits. Uh, as we try to articulate to say, we can no longer uh, depend on the processes that were adopted in the past, uh, that. Uh, uh, had a, a process of, of, of visits where we, we assess a lot of uh, uh, applicants' uh, ability to, to train uh, when we visit their premises. So we will be looking at other, other uh, methods to improve the process. So the processes, uh, the, the queries that I got, I got six, and uh, others were purely on the frustration of the process that has gone slow. And we, we, we apologize and we are of the view that we, we will be dealing with the backlogs uh, in the best possible manner, given our, our limitations, uh, the fact that we still have a lot to learn to do all the work via, via the, the system without visiting the, the projects. There was a... I think a, a much more, uh, I will say, strategic question on the responsiveness. Uh, we acknowledge, uh, I know that uh, the chairperson of the CETA has uh, acknowledged and apologized to our stakeholders that uh, although there might have been some reasons, uh, there is no excuse for, for poor service by services CETA. Uh, we, we apologize that sometimes we have not been responding in the manner that uh, uh, shows commitment to, to, to our uh, uh, mission and, and values as a CETA. Uh, we are focusing on improving that. Uh, the gaps are still big, uh, but we, we, we are working on, on strategies to improve on our responsiveness as a CETA. Uh, I received... Uh, two questions on LMIS, uh, and, and, and again, uh, the questions were, were more on, 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 on the work uh, that is dependent on, on LMIS, uh, which is the training, uh, accreditation, uh, certification, and any process that requires learner, learner inputs. Uh, so, so we, we explained in terms of uh, that there is work uh, that we have done to improve the reliability, but there's also future work uh, that needs to improve integration, uh, including empowering our provincial officers to be able to train and, and capacitate our stakeholders at, at, their, at the provinces. Uh, I received four questions on inter transfers. 
uh, the, the process of, of intercity transfers is that they continuously uh, get submitted to, to our executive uh, committee uh, chaired by the chairperson of the board. Uh, it's an ongoing process, uh, and, and we have approved uh, some uh, in our most recent uh, executive committee meeting in, in December. And it's, a, it's an ongoing process that Services CETA looks at the application. And, and we, 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 we appreciate that in some cases there are delays, uh, but uh, some delays are caused by uh, the interactions where we, we seek to understand the basis of request for moving from one CETA to the next. So, but it is more an operational process uh, that we, we, we are always involved in, and including uh, engaging other sitters uh, on similar high-level discussions on uh, the, the stakeholder movement uh, from one sitter to the sitter. We also had uh, one question on bursaries uh, on a specific pro pro program that we, we are funding. Uh, I think the program basically has been completed. There were delays in terms of finalizing it. I know uh, the Gibbs program, it's, it, it's very close to the accounting authority's heart. Uh, there were certain delays, and, and, and I'm happy to say those, those delays uh, were dealt with. Uh, the CFO uh, finalized that process uh, because there were certain uh, information that uh, we didn't have that we needed to deal with before we can, we can, we can finalize, finalize the process. Uh, there were comments uh, on, I think four comments on audit-related issues. Uh, I, I battled to, to put my fingers on some of the issues, uh, but needless to say, uh, the, the, the report of the Auditor General highlighted uh, one significant uh, point that uh, I want us to take home with, uh, that uh, the audit opinion was expressed on the first submission of Services CETA, uh, meaning that uh, when Services CETA made changes, uh, it, it was not uh, done on time, uh, and hence it was not incorporated in the opinion. That, that's very, very important. So whatever that the CETA was going to change or changed, uh, there was not enough time to process those changes. And it's it, needless to say that uh, the environment under which the audit uh, for 2019-2020 was conducted was abnormal. Uh, hence, the deadlines were not normally where they used to be. So the, the, the whole process, I think, from both sides was not normal. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I think I've, I've addressed uh, the question that uh, I received. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to adoption of the budget and annual performance plan. Please use the chat functionality to indicate whether you propose or second the motion to adopt the budget and the annual performance plan. Please remember to mention your name and surname and include your company address. Thank you. As we await for a mover and a seconder, um, I would like to just to make a response on the issue around the audit. Um, the chair, myself as a chairperson and the chairperson of the Finance Committee and our chairperson of the Audit Committee have met with the Auditor General. Um, and um, they express, uh, or in our discussions, they did mention in terms of as the CEO. I just mentioned in terms of when the opinion 
um, uh, was submitted or made on our first submission, and some of the information that was given afterwards um, were not incorporated in the final decision. Um, on the recommendations that were made by the Auditor General, by the Auditor General, um, we have received as the accounting authority the remedial action plan from the CEO. Um, we have then, as the accounting authority yesterday, uh, recommend that we or recommended to the audit committee so that the audit committee can also give the input to the AA in terms of whether they are satisfied with the, uh, the remedial plan. Uh, the second issue that we have decided as the AA was that the audit committee and the finance committee must from now on monitor the implementation of the remedial action. Because I think the Auditor General, make, uh, the manager, have made the reference to that we that are charged with governance, that we should also take responsibility of the audit remedial action plan. It should not be only that something that we delegate to management and then a year later, we, then we wake up and we sit with, this, with a similar situation. So we are taking that very seriously, and we want to bring the seat back to a clean audit. I will now ask those um, that, uh, that are monitor our screen, uh, please to give indication in terms of uh, whether we have a move in a second. We have a proposal by the name of Marina Ritter from Performance and Development Consulting. We have our seconder from Fall Risk Consultancy, Mr. Jan van der Baer. Thank you very much. Um, in the absence of any other mover or proposal, we will then uh, declare this uh, business plan and budget as accepted. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, to give us our vote of thanks, please welcome Ms. Julia Nzimande. Ladies and gentlemen, our stakeholders, chairperson and the CEO, before I start with the vote of thanks, we would like to show a video of the many infrastructure projects of the Services Center. Eastern Cape at Ngeleni. This is one of our infrastructure projects, the Services Center. This is an initiative with the South African Homeless Association. This project is called Sinenjongo Project. As a CETA, our primary mandate is facilitation of skills development, specifically in the services sector. A services CETA is building structure 
to enable the people of Ngaleni to operate their chicken farming business. Yeah, this business is not solely a services sitter aligned initiative. It will involve the rural development initiatives. It will involve the initiatives by the Department of Small Businesses. More importantly, it is one of the initiatives by Services CETA to try and improve the lives of the rural people. We had very high expectations of this project, but more than anything else, we are of the view it's going to enable the people of Ngaleni to stand up and create opportunities for themselves. A popular project. Sing a banda bakubaze kileyo. Sing a banda bakubaze kileyo nje se kubaze gen gen lela lela ezo shoka shoka ne. Kukwa malongo mizima yetu. Abanye batata kato wasentloko. Abanye bana mshama nyengam. Abanye bana nengalonga nye. Abanye abasebenzi alsebenzi talalomzi malonge. Abanye ba amange wheelchairs. reception Atalele kono ba ufumane kapilo mdo amfuna yunga pagati. Sibe ne office at bin. Sibe na yone kichi. Sibe na yone offices. Askazi arrange ki office basa wa makanja ni lebe yandon, lebe yandon, lebe yandon. Kwa basi za chonge isa kiote basi te kutoku kichimi kwa siso kwa su arrange. Usita, usinga tisida kakulu. Zi community ebinga tatu inchi ni inga funda anga kunga sekeni zonga bantu abanye baba babu yema kuhudi bese baasha kena ngo bina zakoono kuto akutengo kufika kwa ake sasa kwa choka kanya isban agu kanga kukanya isban je upela apimkano ne la lezi kufuchia ne la ulazi ni nyikos ziyaza chapa zede kaza fusa namla kubunguane. Bawa lega kuhul, because even kwe kwe zi kwe zi ndaos na bantu ana toli crime kuhul. Kama tama ndaba kwa laba ndao ni, ba ba kwa zo ba ba liba lenge zi ndo, zi ngalunga anga. Kwa bantu ba kwa zile, kwa bantu ba acha, ba peta wa sebenge nzi ubisi ni kwa beti ndaos ukula, la kwa tuangu ku, ba chete kwenye zile project. Ba kwa zo ba ingeti ba sabi ndao ni, kuna ba 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 siti ku zo ba kwa zo tiba kumani zile ubisi na pali. The project is Balulekile Apa Ingelin. If you get a lens, I will change your illusion. Yaba Fundisa Abanto Easy Kills Abanye Batunga Abanye Balima. See Ziva so no be lapem con when Kakulu was in a project. Says Bona Noko. If you get a sepultula Yaba Putula and Abanto Anabetu. Yaba putula na bantu abaku bazekle na ati tina singa basha lias bega kuzinga elfizo. On behalf of the Accounting Authority, its chairperson and CEO of the Services CETA, I wish to keep this vote of thanks short and virtual. Allow me to begin by thanking the outgoing board for the important work they have done over the course of their tenure, and let me also give our thanks to the previous CEO. We would also like to thank the Auditor General for her report and their presentation today. To our stakeholders, a big thank you to everyone who has joined us for our virtual annual general meeting on the 28th of January, 2021. With being online, it definitely looked a little different. Well, Chairman, CEO, ladies and gentlemen, such an event could not happen overnight. 
It requires planning and a bird's eye for detail. We as the board are very fortunate enough to be supported by a team of very motivated and dedicated members and colleagues from the Services CETA who know their jobs and are result oriented. I thank everybody for their participation and their willingness to complete tasks beyond their comfort zone. The video you've just seen today showcases, and it's one of, one of many, that skills development and training is being offered in line with government's transformational imperatives, as set out in the National Skills Development Strategy 3, targeting and empowering the unemployed, the marginalized youth, disabled youth, women with strong focus on rural development. As the services CETA, we can certainly be proud to showcase how far we have come and are looking forward to the future. All these projects remain relevant and as the CEO and the chair have said, collaboration with all stakeholders remains important. Through the services CETA, you as the stakeholder can be lauded for your commitment and support in meeting the needs of communities at their place of residence. The accounting authority of the services CETA would like to thank our stakeholders for attending this annual general meeting. We appreciate your continuous interest and valued support. We thank you for being with us here today. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. stakeholders. We thank you for joining us. The presentations will be available for download on the platform under the Services CETA Organizational Updates tab. Remember to wash your hands and sanitize often and always wear a mask when in public places. On behalf of the Services CETA Accounting Authority and Management, we thank you for your presence. The meeting is now officially concluded. Thank you.